On The Ledge podcast with your host, Jane Perrone. It's another episode. The sun's shining. Hooray! This week's show gets down to the serious business of succulent propagation. Yes, we're talking about how to make more plants from your precious collection in ways other than sowing from seed. Which I know is a way of propagation, but got to narrow it down a bit for this episode. And our question of the week also concerns a succulent. It's a jade plant with a split in it. Just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Thank you, thank you, thank you to my new patrons. That's Claudia, JC and Tommy. Find out more about how to support On The Ledge by visiting patreon.com forward slash on the ledge. My newsletter went out earlier this week. If you're not signed up, do go to my website, janeperone.com and click on the newsletter link that's in the top right hand corner and rectify that immediately. If you are signed up, but you don't think you've received the newsletter, do have a look in your spam trap. And if you're still not seeing the message, do drop me a line and I'll get it sorted out pronto. At the request of quite a few listeners, I've turned the On The Ledge Sew Along Facebook group into a general houseplant fans of On The Ledge group, which you're all welcome to join. This is a place where you can share your plant pictures, ask for advice, talk about the show, tell me what you would like to see coming up and anything else houseplant related. And of course, you can still post about the On The Ledge Sew Along there. If you want to make your post stand out, then do use the hashtag OTL Along, and I want to keep seeing your amazing progress with your plants. Just bear in mind, if you do join, that you need to answer the questions, which basically involve just saying what your favourite houseplants are and agreeing to abide by the guidelines of the group, which are on the pin post at the top. This will keep things nice and simple and make sure everyone knows what they're doing. You'll find the link in my show notes, but you can also just search for houseplant fans of On The Ledge on Facebook and you'll find us no problem. In fact, Carol Connolly just posted a picture of her first tomato harvest of the year from her micro tomatoes, which she's grown from seed. So well done to you, Carol. And Rich Marcotte has also shared some tiny, 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 cute little Nepenthes seedlings, which look amazing and already have some miniature pictures on one or two, which is incredible. We're also sharing pictures of our Hesseon books. So please do take some photos of your Hesseon houseplant expert copies and add them to the thread. Then you'll really feel like part of the gang. I'd love to see you on the group. It's a great way of finding out more about you. So how can you make more succulents? Well, the great news is it is so super easy, but you do need to know a few simple facts before you start. And one of the main things is figuring out what kind of succulent you've got, because not all succulents are created equal when it comes to propagation. With some, it's as easy as taking off a single leaf and rooting that. You can do this with things like Echeverias, Haworthias, Sedums, Adramiscus and Gasterias. So these will all propagate from just a single leaf. Many succulents, including quite a few cacti, can be propagated by removing offsets or little baby plants that spring up around the base of the parent plant. They're sometimes also known as pups. And the great thing about this is that the genetic material of those babies is identical to the adults, which means that they'll be much quicker to flower than if you were to grow something from seed. And you can also take stem cuttings, which are pieces of shoot taken off the parent plant. These tend to be quicker to establish than individual leaf cuttings and anything that you can take a leaf cutting of generally you could also take a stem cutting of depending on the structure of the plant. So for something like an Echeveria for example if your plants become very leggy and etiolated over the winter time you can simply chop off its head leave a base rosette of on the base plant take that top section off remove some lower leaves and root that. And there you've got that as a new plant. Plus you can also keep the lower plant which will re-sprout and grow again. And the final method, which is kind of a variation on taking a stem cutting is called grafting. And this is very common with certain types of cactus. And this is where you fuse together two separate plants. The bottom plant, which is the one that will have the roots is called the stock. And And that's usually something that's quite vigorous and healthy. And then there's the top part called the scion. 
These get joined together and over time they'll actually grow into one another and become effectively one plant. This is really useful if you've got a plant that suffered some damage, you can cut off the damage and start something new on the top. If your cactus becomes too ridiculously tall, or if you just like looking at something that looks a bit different. If all of this sounds a bit intimidating, the main thing to remember with succulent plant material is that it's pretty tough. The only thing that's gonna kill it really is being overwatered. And to give you an example of that, I've had some cuttings sitting on a tile in my podcast studio otherwise known as my office, for the whole of the winter. And yes, they are looking a little bit dried up and wrinkly, but they're still very much alive and they've all grown root systems over the winter and they'll be absolutely fine if potted up now into some good cactus and succulent compost. So really, if in doubt, keep them dry and you'll find that success comes pretty easily with these fellows. Now, it just so happens that I've got some succulent propagation to be getting along with. So come and join me for some pottering in the potting shed. So we've come out to my potting shed for a bit of succulent propagation time. So. I think we'll start with looking at leaf propagation. And with me, I've got an Echeveria variety unknown. I'm afraid I've lost the label for this guy. Um, and I, it's one that's got a bit etiolated and leggy over the winter. So a few weeks ago, probably about three weeks ago, I chopped off its head. It's a cruel method, but it has to be done. Um, took the top rosette off and I just literally left it sitting in a china bowl next to the original plant and looking, lifting it up now I can see it's already formed roots that are a few well about one or two centimeters long it feels pretty floppy and it definitely could do with some water but it's ready to go into some soil now and looking at the base well it's putting out some nice new growth but I'm also going to take off some of these leaves and use them for leaf propagation the crucial thing when you're taking off leaves for leaf propagation is getting all of the leaf off in one go and making sure it doesn't get damaged because the base of the, of the leaf contains the meristematic material, the meristem, which is what produces new cells and new life. So I'm gently pulling away a leaf and it's come away nicely, completely intact. So that's a good one. If you pull away a leaf and it just doesn't come away in one piece, then chuck that one because it just won't propagate properly. Uh, here's another one coming off nicely. So I'm gonna take off about three or four off here and keep this one growing for more future propagation. Now these just need to sit somewhere for about anything from two days to two weeks to callus over. Once they've callused over, they may actually start producing roots of their own accord without me doing anything whatsoever, but we can help them along. I've just got four coming off here now. So there's different things you can do with these. Some people literally just leave them on a glass or china dish and wait until plantlets form. That's one very, very easy way of doing it. Some people decide to be a bit more proactive. You can lay them on a damp sheet of kitchen roll. That's happy. Lots of people have success with that method. Or you can lay them on some gritty compost. And people swear by misting them, but I find that it's better to mist the compost rather than the actual leaves because that can encourage rot. And within a matter of days or weeks, you should find baby plantlets and roots forming. And at that point, if they aren't already in some gritty compost, that's the point to get them planted. The original leaf will gradually die away and you'll be left with a new, the new plant, which is what, you, what you're looking for. It's a really fun and easy way of making new plants. I definitely recommend giving it a try if you haven't already. And at this point, I've got to take my cardigan off because it's actually boiling hot in here. Whew. Right, so let's have a look at some, some little leaf cuttings that I took last year. These ones are doing all right. They are have grown new root systems and yes, they're looking pretty decent. They could do with the water, but they're going to be fine. 
Now let's move on to looking at pups or offsets. Now I've got a Gasteria Alo, which is a cross between a uh, Gasteria and an Alo, which I had some babies uh, around the plant. And all I did was I pulled that plant out of its pot gently and I've pulled off those babies and they've been sitting here for a couple of weeks callousing over and now they're ready to go into some gritty compost. So let's get on with that. You can buy proprietary, sorry I've just knocked a pot over, you can buy proprietary cactus and succulent compost uh, but I tend to make up my own. This is a mixture of Doninus number no. two with some non-clumping cat litter and some perlite mixed in for good measure. Roughly kind of 50% compost, 50% perlite and litter. So it's a nice free draining mix and I've got my pot. I'm just going to stick a little bit of cardboard in the bottom to stop the water running straight through. I don't use crocs because it's been proven that these don't really work to aid drainage. In goes the compost and in goes my first pup. Some of them have got some roots, this one's got a little bit of root showing. But not a great deal. And I'm just going to put it in and just try to get the level so that it was the, it's the same as it was in the previous pot when it was in with its parent plant. And now it needs watering in. And I am sure that will be going away very, very quickly in this lovely warm weather. Don't let it have absolutely blaring full sunshine if it hasn't been used to it up until this point, because you will burn your plant. I made a silly mistake this week with one of my Alo Argovoides and forgot to bring it out of full sunshine. And I've paid the price with a burnt plant with red marks. So I'm very annoyed with myself, but it's very easily done. If that's what's happened to you this year, don't worry, you're not alone. So here I've got another alo, which is very pot bound and overcrowded with lots of pups growing in one pot. So this needs to be split out uh, and dealt with because the, it just isn't very happy in its current situation. So this alo is a hybrid and I can't remember what its name is. Sorry, I'm not doing very well on the names today. Um, but it's got a lot of babies that need to be removed and it's overcrowded to the extreme. So I'm going to try removing a lot of these pups and repotting the plant and allowing some of these pups room to breathe in their own pots and that should hopefully make them a lot happier. I'm going to have to mix up some new compost. I'm just doing this in a washing up bowl because it's easy, an easy way to deal with your plants and keep the mess contained if you don't have your own potting bench. So in goes the John Innes number two and I'm going to put in roughly similar quantities of a mixture of cat litter, the non-clumping kind, so it's not full of dust, and also perlite, which is a very lightweight stuff that helps to improve drainage and it's made from volcanic rock. Very lightweight, easy to carry home from the store. Okay, this gets mixed together. And now to find some new homes for these pups. So the original plant, the parent plant, is gonna go into its own pot with some fresh compost around it. It'll be way happier. And then the babies will have either be grouped in small groups or on their own. And when you're repotting anything, make sure that you press the compost down firmly, but not too firmly around the edge of the plant because the roots need to make contact with the soil. This is getting filled up nicely. And there she blows, that's brilliant. And now I've got some pups to pot up. Just gonna do one for you, so you don't get too bored listening to me potting away. Find the right size pot is the first thing, not too large, so that the plant becomes overwhelmed. Now, 
most of these have got roots on them so they don't really need to callus over they can just go straight into the pot if they had no roots i would allow them to callus over for a couple of weeks before potting them on these guys are good to go so warm and toasty out there in the potting shed it really does heat up quickly out there one other set of propagating that I wanted to mention was the Senecio family I know that string of pearls Senecio rolianus is just such a popular plant right now that it's worth mentioning how to propagate that because if you have one of these plants you'll find that you're always being asked to do some cuttings and really it's quite simple as we've already seen from other succulent propagation just cut away a string let it dry out on a plate for a few days and then lay it on the surface of some gritty compost and you'll find that it very quickly roots away. If you've got a spearhead senecio, which is Senecio clinii formis, this is a plant which can often get too spindly, particularly if it's in not strong enough light. And I've got one of those right now. And so I'm simply going to chop off the top section of the plant, allow it to dry out and root it. Bear in mind with any succulent cutting that you're cutting as a stem, the roots will develop from the leaf nodes. That's the point where the leaf meets the stem. That's where the roots will start. And it won't necessarily be at the bottom of the stem that these roots start. They could happen at any leaf node along the stem. So if you've got a really long piece of stem, you could always cut it into several sections and pot those up to make a bushier plant. With any succulent propagation, Spring is a great time to start because everything's coming into growth and the plants have the whole of the long summer ahead to really put on some growth before the autumn. And now let's go into a little bit more detail about grafting. I was going to show you some grafting, but I've realised that I don't have any plant material that I actually want to graft right now. So this is going to have to be theory rather than practice. I have grafted before. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's a bit of an experiment. It's always worth a try if you've got plant material that you're not too worried if it doesn't make it. The key thing is you've got to get the stock, that's the base part, and the scion, the bit on top, to actually grow together. And you've got to get the vessels that carry nutrients and liquids up and down the plant to join up and fuse together. That's the key point. And you do this by cutting off the stem at the top of your stock and the stem at the bottom of your scion and joining these together, lining up the vessels as best you can and then holding them in place, usually with a rubber band or something similar to that. It's tricky. You've got spines involved. You are going to get spiked. Now, when it comes to choosing that stock, there are a few different varieties that are highly recommended, depending on what you're trying to graft on top. And I'll put a list to all of those species in my show notes for anyone who really wants to get into this. It's something you can play about with, but if you really want to go deep into grafting, it's something you really need to read around the subject before you start. So I'm going to go away and get some cactus material that I'd like to get grafting. And in a future episode, we'll go into this in greater depth. If you've had success with grafting, please let me know. I'd love to hear your tips and tricks. Oh, and just one more thing about propagation. I know a lot of people are into water propagation these days. And strange though it may sound, this is entirely possible with succulent cuttings. As long as they've been calloused over first, you can use the water method. And just as an interesting aside, I've seen people talking online about coloured glass rooting containers when you're rooting cuttings in water. And I, from all my research, I think I've, did, I've concluded that this is completely untrue. There's a great post on gardenprofessors.com, which is a fabulous site for debunking bad garden science. And the conclusion there is that although coloured glass rooters are more attractive than plain old glass jars... It, there is absolutely no science behind the idea that they are the best way to encourage rooting and that in fact the best way to encourage rooting cuttings in water is light so not bright sunlight but rather indirect light perhaps a north facing window so the water doesn't get too hot and obviously knowing which species will root from water, from cuttings in the first place i'll post that link in my show notes if you want to read the whole thing so no harm in putting your cuttings in attractive jars 
but really an old glass jam jar will do just as well. And now that we've got the newly refettled Facebook group going, I'd love to see your succulent propagation efforts over there. So do go over and post a picture of your pups, your offsets, your leaf cuttings and anything else that you've been propagating in the world of succulents. This week's question comes from Nicole, who sent me a message saying that she has a jade plant with a split in the bark. She's had this plant for more than 10 years and... Over the years, as with a lot of us, the care has been somewhat inconsistent. Sometimes she's remembered to water, sometimes she hasn't. But she's giving it a little bit more water recently and more sunlight. And she's noticed that the skin or bark on the trunk, which is about 4.5 centimetres in diameter, has split and a small branch has grown out of it. A four centimetres long, the size of this split, and the split seems to be healing and turning brown like the rest of the skin on the trunk. Now... Nicole wants to remove that branch and pot it up or possibly lop off, uh, lop off some other new growth and start again. And she wants to know how she should proceed. So I guess the first thing to wonder is why this has happened in the first place. With an older plant like this, it sounds like it's quite large and venerable. The likelihood is that the plant has re- either reacted to some damage Or perhaps an increase in watering may have caused this split where the plant has grown used to a certain amount of water. Then more water arrives and as a result, the plant's materials can't cope with the new quantity of water and splits. Either way, it's not the end of the world for this jade plant. They are incredibly tough plants. And it sounds like this one is coping with the damage Okay, It's healing up. The branch that's coming out can certainly be taken off Nicole and propagated. Leave it to callus over for a couple of days, as I've already explained in this episode, and then get it potted up in some gritty compost and away you go. Be careful doing any other surgery on this plant, though, because jade plants can look a bit ugly if you start hacking away at them. So do think before you remove any more growth. The danger with damage like this is that it can cause either rots or some kind of bacteria to get in and start damaging the plant but it doesn't appear that that's happened in this case which is great and the good news is that jade plants are such tough plants that even if the worst case scenario happened and the main trunk was irretrievably damaged you could always take cuttings from other stems on the plant and make new plants pretty easily i do hope that helps nicole And I know I normally only do one question a week, but I had a query from Sophie Walter that I just felt like I had to answer straight away uh, because it reminded me of an incident that happened many years ago. That's a salutary lesson for anyone who wants to grow plants quite literally on the ledge. And Sophie told me that she's been researching small house plants to be placed on a long shelf above my bed. She is after recommendations for plants that are around 30 centimetres or so tall or perhaps trailing. And she says they'd be out of direct sunlight and drafts. And what I wanted to mention was that this reminded me of an incident many, many years ago in a previous house where I had just such a shelf above my bed. Now, it all went very well. I had some lovely plants up there. I can't remember what they were, but it all went very well until the point where I had a dream, a nightmare possibly, which involved me in my sleep jumping up on the bed and I started grabbing hold of the plants on the shelf above my head, which As you can imagine, while you're asleep, that's not a very sensible idea. Fortunately, my boyfriend managed to wake me up before I did any serious damage. But it is worth noting that having a shelf above your bed with houseplants in it can be a bit dangerous from a health and safety point of view because things can get knocked, particularly if they're trailing plants. You might accidentally grab onto something and it's not much fun to have compost and even worse pots pouring down on your head. So I just wanted to throw it out there for anyone who might be thinking of setting up this kind of arrangement. Perhaps make sure that your pots are well anchored and not likely to cause you a head injury. In answer to Sophie's question, though, I think that the Peperomia family is the answer here. There are lots of really compact Peperomias and some of them would be ideal. Peperomia caparata, the ripple Peperomia with the very leaves that look like your fingers do when you come out of a long bath are pretty small and compact and clumping in their fashion and these would be ideal because they're not that bothered about 
conditions. They'll be happy up there in a bright or semi-shady spot and they don't need a huge amount of watering so you won't have to be splashing water around your bedroom too often. I would also recommend something like Peperomia polybotria raindrop which is the looky-likey of the Chinese money plant Pilea peperomioides. That's also a pretty tough plant that won't need a heck of a lot of water and not too large. There are trailing peperomias, of course, and some of these are quite weeny, such as Peperomia prostata, the creeping peperomia, which has attractive little silvery marked leaves and a red stem. But as I say, just bear in mind, you don't want anything trailing down too low so that it's likely to catch on to you as you try to get into bed. So there you go. There's a mental image for you. Me dancing around on my bed, compost flying everywhere. <laughs> uh, I hope that I hope that's helped, Sophie. And if anyone else has suggestions for compact plants that would do well in this setting, do give me a shout. At Jane Perone is my Twitter handle and you can find me on Instagram as j.l.perone. And of course, you can drop me an email to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. Well, we're wrapping up this week's show now, but I'll be back next week with the exciting episode featuring a day trip out that I went on this week. I got the chance to see inside the newly restored temperate house at the world famous Kew Gardens in London, which has been the subject of a five year restoration project. And it was fascinating to see inside this amazing building. I'll bring you some audio from that and an interview with one of the horticulturists there who happens to be a bit of a houseplant fan. And over on my Patreon page, for those of you who are patrons, you'll find a new episode going up very soon with lots of information information about the Monstera family, which is definitely worth a listen. In other exciting news, well, for me anyway, I have signed up with an advertising agency, so some ads are going to start appearing on On The Ledge, but they'll all be read by me and they'll be pre-vetted by me to be stuff that I actually am happy to recommend to you guides. So hopefully it won't be too intrusive or annoying and will in fact bring to your attention some interesting products and services that you might want to use. And the great thing is it will allow me to expand what I'm doing on On The Ledge and provide all the stuff that I'm desperate to offer you, including more blog posts, extra content and all that vital stuff like a new microphone, which I could really do with. to close this week I just want to bring you some words of wisdom from our friend Dr Herseon who reminds us a new plant gets homesick even in good conditions many varieties suffer a distinct shock when they move from their well-lit and humid glass house home to your walled in and dry living room don't assume that the conditions must be wrong if the plant looks jaded for the first few weeks that's great advice so remember if you bought new plants let them settle in give them a chance and don't worry if they look a bit down for a while Thanks, Dr. Hesayon. We love you. Until next week, then. Bye. you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin, and O oh Mallory by Josh Woodward. All licensed under Creative Commons. See my website for details.